Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 336, Joe and Big Al spitball a tax-efficient retirement withdrawal strategy for Lori in Illinois, complete with sound effects, and they spitball a saving and retirement strategy for Brad in California and a social security and required minimum distribution strategy for Anne in New York. Plus, how can Sharon in Waukesha leverage her whole life insurance policy? And is Edward in Illinois taking too much risk with his investments in preferred stocks? Oh, and Joe's added something new to the list when you write in and tell us about your cars and pets. Three guesses what it is, and the first two don't count. But first, Jerry calls YMYW to learn about the mechanics and safety of doing a 401k to IRA rollover. Visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Ask Joe and Big Al on air to send in your questions as an email or a voice message. And remember, those voice messages get first priority. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson and CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA. All right, uh, let's get to Jerry. Yes, my name's Jerry. My question is, I'm 72 years old. I only have uh, about 67, 66,000 in my 401k. I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm going to need some of it cash, but uh, I was going to roll it over an IRA and I just wondered, how do I know which IRA to roll it over to? Is a bank safe or should I roll it over into some other type of IRA and will it hurt me to take out a certain amount of cash before in the 401 or or after I roll it over an IRA if I was wanting to take out some cash? Thanks. Uh, Great question, Jerry. So uh, when when any dollar that you take out of a 401k or IRA, so he wants a 401k rollover, put it into an IRA. uh, He's got about 70 grand and he wants to take a little cash out. Right. So yes, you can have access to 100% of the money, but just understand it's fully taxable. Yeah. And so you can get cash out before you roll or after. It doesn't really matter. It's the same tax either way. Like, let's say out of the 70,000, Jerry, you take out $5,000, then $5,000 gets added to your tax return as additional income. So you have to pay tax on it at whatever your tax rate is. And looking at where do, where does he put the money? Um, you can open up any brokerage account. You can go to a bank. So is a bank safe? Sure. Uh, you can open up an IRA that's, let's say if you just want a CD, something extremely safe that's right. that's guaranteed, you can open up an IRA at a bank. And then with that $66,000, you can purchase a, a CD or ladder some CDs at 10, 20,000 a piece. Uh, you can move the money into a brokerage account like Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Vanguard. Uh, you can go direct to a brokerage um, house like a Merrill Lynch or um, or, or any of the above or, or independent advisor. Yeah. Um, independent advisor. Vanguard has some, you know, you can the invest I, with them. Yeah. The IRA is just a tax code, right? The, the investment is the key component, Jerry. And so if you open it up at a bank at Vanguard, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's all the same. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think that's a key point. And, and sometimes we forget to kind of talk about it this way because the, an IRA is an IRA. It doesn't really matter where you open it up. It's the investments that make the difference. And so if you, Jerry, if you want the safest investment possible, I would go to a bank because a bank would be FSL, F, FS, FDI. FDI. Thank you. FDIC. Yeah. Where's my brush? I need to feather my hair. Yeah. It's, it's out of whack. I'm not thinking right. Anyway, you get the, you get that government protection. If something goes wrong with the bank, that's the safest way. The problem with that, of course, is you don't earn very much money. And over time you will actually lose money to inflation, but it is safe. Yep. Um, so hopefully that answers your question because uh, w- one last thought on this is that an IRA, Roth IRA, we would get the question quite a bit. It's like, what does a Roth IRA pay? Um, it doesn't, yeah. it, it depends on what you invest in. Correct. So it's not an investment An IRA is not an investment or a Roth IRA or 401k. It's the, the items that you put into those overall shells. Yeah. Um, if you will. Yeah. And so I guess when you're thinking about an IRA versus a 401k, there are differences between that. Those are different vehicles, but one IRA is just the same as another one. It's just how you invest it. All righty. Uh, we got Lori from Illinois writes in. I drive a 2021 Honda CRV touring edition. Yeah. It must be nice. Ooh. Touring edition. T- touring. Tour- touring. Yeah. Touring. <laughs> I mean, Tor- does touring? Client get, uh, I mean, is that like bigger, smaller? It's, I mean, it's probably cooler, right? Because you're going to be touring in it. 
2021. That's yeah. Nice. Yeah. Brand new. Um, okay. We had a Maltese. Lasa Apso. Lasa Apso. Oh, there's the picture on screen. Very cute dog. Okay. Oh, that is kind of a cute little pupper. That's like one you'd put in your purse. <laughs> if we had a purse. Uh, okay. A Maltese Lasa Paso. Uh, Something like that. For 11 years. Uh, but do not have any plans to get another dog in the future. Uh, my husband and I are the same age. Any plans on retiring in two years at age 59 and a half? I will continue to work part time and I make around $45,000 a year. I will carry our health and dental insurance when he retires. Today, we have $1.2 million in combined IRAs, $650 in combined Roth accounts, and $1.2 million in a taxable brokerage account. Uh, we plan on converting money from our traditional IRA to Roth up to the 24% tax bracket to help avoiding getting clobbered with high RMDs. If we want to live on $120,000 a year when my husband retires, how much should we pull from each bucket so that's most tax efficient? I figure we will live on some of our traditional IRA money right when he retires up to age 72. So that will help draw down the amount we need to convert. I plan on taking Social Security at age 67. He will at age 70. We do not have any other retirement income. Thanks for... Any spitballing you can provide, Lori, Illinois. Great, great question. Yeah, what kind of spitballing? You start. All right. I can spitball this. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, that comes with sound effects now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, where's my calculator here? <laughs> um, she's very tax diversified. Yeah, already. Yeah, look at that. I, I like to see this. Usually, um, you know, what we see so it's about, she's got about one third in Roth and two thirds in a taxable brokerage account. Okay. Yeah, I get that. Um, what one, two in brokerage, one, two. Um, and then what was the other amount? 650. All right. So we'll call it $3 million. I could have easily done that in my head. <laughs> uh, so that's next year. Okay. So he'll be 60. She's working 45. So let's take 120, 45 minus. So that's $75,000. That's into 3 million. What do you think that is? 3%? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I like the distribution rate. So Lori, the first step of all this, or, or anyone that's listening, I guess, when you're, you're spitballing a retirement analysis, um, you have two really good key components that most people forget to tell us when they write in. That A, how much money that you want to spend, and then B, how much money that you have. And then the other ancillaries are really good too. Like, hey, I'm going to make $45,000 a year for the next few years yeah. as part-time income. That's helpful. It is yeah. very helpful in figuring this out. Because what you want to do is take the amount of money that you have, $3 million. And then you look at, okay, that's my nest egg. And you have to figure out what the nest egg needs to do to produce income for you to sustain a lifestyle that you're accustomed to or that you want to enjoy. Right. And so you said $120,000. That's another key component. Awesome. And then you said 45,000 is what we're going to make. So you take 120 of what you want to spend minus 45,000, which is going to come in as fixed income. And then that leaves a shortfall of $75,000. Right. So the $3 million needs to supply you with $75,000 of income. Right. I think, or is that clear enough? Yeah. You're on right on track. All right. So then you take $75,000, you divide it into 3 million and you come up with a burn rate or distribution rate. Yeah. That distribution rate in this example is 3%. And at 59 and a half, 3%, I would say Al and I would think that that's a, that's a pretty good percentage, right, right. on track. But yeah, that, that's right. And then uh, I guess when husband stops working, Social Security will take over. So Hus no, husband stop working. She's going to work. Oh, she's going to work. I got it backwards. Yep. Okay. So when she stops working and they then they eventually take Social Security, they're basically in the same spot. You got so, it. So I like it. Okay. So now then you can start throwing on the other layers of complexity right and so her real question is well how much money should i take out from each of these pools right uh, from a tax perspective well the forty five thousand dollars of income is going to come to you as ordinary income because that's wages yep so one way to look at this is to say all right well maybe i don't want to get myself out of the 12 percent tax bracket so 45 um eighty thousand dollars is roughly um, the top of the 12% tax bracket. Correct. So I take 45 minus 25, which is the standard deduction. 
Yep. Are, are you good with that? Yeah, I'm good. Um, so that would give me what thirty thousand or, or uh, twenty thousand, right? Of taxable income. So then you can play with the other accounts. You can then pull sixty thousand dollars, let's say, from your retirement account and live off of that, and then that would keep you in the twelve percent tax bracket. Right. Okay. So, but you you need seventy five. So you could take the other $15,000 and you could pull that from your brokerage account and virtually pay zero tax. So you're short 75,000. You could fill up the, the, the ordinary income tax bucket to 12%, right? By pulling it from the retirement account. And then you could take the others from the other account to keep you in the lowest bracket. That's one way to look at it. I think a better strategy is to convert. Yes. Take more money out of the out of the brokerage account, so you've got very little income, so you can convert. And I agree with everything you said. I, I think of it maybe just a slightly different way. I would say if eighty thousand is the taxable income, the highest amount you want, then you add the standard deduction of twenty five. So now you're at one hundred five thousand. One hundred five thousand is how much ordinary income you can handle and still stay in that lowest bracket, right? And so you've already, you know, so so you've. You've already got 45,000 coming in to get to 105. That's, I think, same answer. Another 60, right? And then the other 15 comes from the brokerage account. But better yet, as you just said, Joe, is if you take more money out of the brokerage account, you'll have less taxable income that will allow you to convert to get to the top of the 12% bracket. You could convert $60,000, stay in that 12% tax bracket, or you could convert, um, let's see, I'm going to say 170 is the top of the 22. 22. Correct. You could go up to that level. You could go to 170. Now, um, and, and of course, we've oversimplified because the brokerage account probably has some interest and dividends and sure. capital gains. So we're oversimplifying, but you get the idea. What you're trying to do is end up with a taxable income of 80,000, realizing you Or get, 170 if you want to see in the yeah, 22. Sure. Right? Because she's stating she wants to convert to the 24. Right. I think just doing the spitball here is that she doesn't have to convert I, in the 24. I, you could easily convert in the 22. I, I would tend to agree with that. Yep, I, I would tend to agree with that. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's it's, a, it's a great strategy because now you can forever stay in the lowest tax brackets by, by having tax diversification. Um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to break. Lori, thank you. And that little Maltese lasso paso. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Uh, I like that. Yeah, it's All great. Right. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and watch the latest and very relevant episode of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show. I'll give you a hint. It's called Financial Planning Must Do's Before You Retire. Your retirement withdrawal strategy may be entirely different than Lori's or anyone else's because your finances, your goals, your needs, and your risk tolerance are unique to you. Getting a free retirement plan spitball analysis from Joan Big Al here on the podcast, it's a good way to get a rough idea if you're on the right track, but this would be a great time to schedule an in-depth financial assessment with one of the certified financial planner professionals on Joan Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors. This assessment is specifically tailored to your needs. It's a comprehensive deep dive into your overall financial situation to help you determine when you can retire, if you can save money on taxes, whether Roth conversions make sense for you, how to craft your ideal retirement withdrawal strategy, when to take Social Security, and much more. Best of all, there's no cost and no obligation. Visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click the big green Get an Assessment button at the top of the page to schedule your free financial assessment now. Let's see, Joe and Big Al. Hello, my name is Brad from California. He actually wrote that like that? That's what he wrote. Interesting. Is that? <laughs> Dear <laughs> Alan, my name is Joe from California. <laughs> he didn't really want us to pin him down to what city. My name is Brad from California. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name's Brad. What do you say? And I'm I, from you, California. You, you would say, I, my name is Joe from Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't you know? <laughs> I was going to uh, say he put that soda on it. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of retirement planning questions I hope you can help me out with. I'm 52. Wife is 49. We have a total of $1.3 million invested in diverse um, and diversified in the market through IRAs, 401ks, and an inherited IRA of 125 grand that we'll need to withdraw by age 61. Um, hold on. The inherited IRA, he'll have to withdraw within 10 years. So I think that's what he's saying there. 
He's 49. He's, he's, 50, oh, he's 52. 52. He's okay, 52. then I'll need to withdraw by age 61. Okay. So he probably got it a year ago. Got I'm it. Guessing. All righty. Because when you have an inherited IRA, you have to take all the money out within 10 years. You don't have to take an RMD anymore each year, but by the 10th year, it has to be all gone. We also have about $190,000 sitting in cash in a money market account. Uh, probably too much. Um, only <laughs> our only debt. I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably too much. Um, our only debt is the mortgage at $270,000 at 3%. We have about $450,000 in equity in the home. We're not sure if we'll stay in California or move to another state at retirement. All right. I'm currently making about $170,000 a year and contributing the max uh, into the 401k each year in an after tax portion of 5% and converting that to a Roth. Hence the garage door. I got it. The Megatron. Yep. Uh, my wife is self-employed and contributing her income of sixteen dollars to eighteen thousand dollars a year in her self-employed 401k. My goal is to retire at age 56 or 57. So he's 52. So he's he wants to retire in about five years. I think we can live comfortably on seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. First, do you think this will be possible or just a dream? I'm looking for some advice on the best strategy to reach the goal. So here's my question. Well, first of all, Brad from California, we don't give advice on this show. We just spitball. We do spitball. Yes. It's called chatting. It's, <laughs> we're having just a friendly conversation. It's a financial chat. Yes. It's tax chat. Uh, because if you start throwing the advice word around there, you know, then that's when compliance. Yes. Gets, liability. Yes. Gets a little uh, up. Oh, yeah. A little dicey. Yeah. Uh, so we don't give advice, FYI. If I have to say that a hundred more times, I will say it a hundred more times. So, but we can talk about your questions here. Should I concentrate on paying down the mortgage with my excessive cash each month and stop investing the after-tax dollars in the 401k to do the Roth conversion? Uh, my answer is no. Absolutely not. 3% interest tax deductible, right. potentially, depending on what your itemized deductions that's, that's are. A, that's a great mortgage. $270,000. Yep. And... Um, what did he say? 3%? 3%. Big yep. now is That's nine grand a year of interest, eight grand something. Um, well, let's see. Your, your, your payment on that's probably what 14,000 bucks a year. Yeah. Um, so from a cash flow perspective, it's not eating you up. Right. And, and it will, and it's fixed, right? right. So it's with inflation, it'll Call just it, keep seeming cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. 1200 bucks a month. Um, oops. That's oh yeah, was I was just wondering what that was. That was playing the little bongos. His, his, his elbow was on the keyboard. Um, <laughs> Glad we didn't get disconnected. Um, or would it be better to max out the after-tax contributions to my four hundred one k to the combined max of sixty four five and converting to the Megatron? Uh, does doing this, I would need to pull down money from my mar money market account, 190000 to help with living expenses. I figured this would be a good way to dollar cost to average my cash into the Roth. Absolutely 100% agree yeah, with that. I like that idea too. Love it. Love it. Um, or should I build up my taxable account currently at $80,000? Why would you build up the taxable account when you could do the Megatron and get all the money tax-free versus at a capital gains yeah. rate? Yeah, would I rather have tax-free income later or capital, in, gains. or capital gains or ordinary income if it's interest? Right? You, you have the same flexibility with the Roth because there's five-fold tax treatment, first in, first out. So, and you're 50, and he wants to retire at 56, 57. Sure. Um, you know, you will have full access to the 401k at age 55 if you separate from service to keep it in the 401k, uh, 401k. So you have access there. Sure. Uh, the Roth money, you probably still want to defer because you're so young and retiring at 55 and having that much more money into a Roth IRA compounding tax free, I think is um, the, the right idea. Yep. So, uh, so I would not build up the, the capital gains. <clears throat> I need to purchase medical at retirement until Medicare at 65. I have a few pensions to supplement my income below. Um, he's going to have a pension al of, uh, let's see, $500 a month at age 60, $1,800 a month at age 65, lump sum payment of $300,000 um, at 56. Social Security, when is the best time to pull it? Um, and is that the end? I, That's this, the end. That was okay. the end of the question. Very good, okay. Brad. I was thinking that this is going to be an eight-pager. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, should I divorce my wife? Uh, should I buy a little kitty? I don't know. I was thinking just, about should I change the oil on my own or should I go to a Jiffy Lube? Just spitball all that for us. <laughs> just a reminder: uh, Joe is offering lifestyle advice. So yes, where are the, where's those the question life, as well? Where's the lifestyle questions? We got to get that back. I mean, I answered one. I must have just totally laid an egg on that. <laughs> um, all right. So Brad from California, I think he's on the right track. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's, so can he retire is the question. He's currently making 100. How much money does he have total again? He's got well, one, he's got, two. He's got 1.3 plus another 100 plus. Plus 200? Yeah. Call so 1.5? 1.5, yeah, ish. Okay. 1.5, and he's got he's going to work for another five years probably. Okay, and, max, and then they're maxing both maxing out. out so yep. let's call it... Um, Fifty thousand dollars of savings. Let's say five years. Let's say he gets five percent on average over the next five years. Okay, that's two point two. And how much money does he need to live off of? Well, it's, it doesn't really say, but he makes one seventy a year. Yeah, he said, "I think we can live comfortably on seventy to eighty k a year." There oh, you go. There you Thank go. Thank you. Three percent of that. Uh, he's close. Yeah. Um, three percent at fifty five is around sixty five thousand is kind of what I guesstimated. So right. he's got, call it one five now. He saves $50,000 a year for the next five years uh, at a 5% growth rate because it's going to be pretty volatile, I, I would imagine, yeah. since we're at pretty high valuations today. Sure. Um, so if he gets five, you know, he's going to have 2.2 million. 3% of 2.2 is 66,000. Uh, so if he can live off of 66, he's right there. Yeah, or... Um have a get a part-time job right make another 15 but also remember you're, you're gonna have to pay for health insurance which is gonna probably be 20 at, grand at minimum a thousand a month probably more like 20 grand yep. right so so maybe in this example maybe you need to have a part-time job where you make about twenty five thousand, something like that yeah um he's close uh you, you probably want to get a little this is spitball and back of the envelope but you can the, how you would really want to dial this thing in is you got this lump sum payment at retirement of another 300,000. Um, I didn't include that. You got the pensions at 60, 65 plus your social security. So your income level, let's say when you retire at 55 with inflation, it's going to increase. Sure. Uh, but then at age 67, you're going to collect social security. Your wife will have social security. So that's going to bring some fixed income into the play. You're going to have these pensions. So again, you want to just kind of look at things of what, what assets do you have to generate income? And use a, a conservative rate or do it the, the do the reciprocal of it is to what are you spending and divide that in or what's your shortfall? What's the demand for the portfolio right. and divide that into the nest egg? Sure. Yeah. And I think something else, and sometimes we talk about 4% is a good distribution rate at age 65 and older. And that's, that's a starting point. It, it, it's going to work for some of you, for others. Like, for example, if you're 65 and you have all your investments in cash, it, it's not going to last. You're going to have to have investments that, that account for growth. On the other hand, when you're 60 or younger, we're usually saying 3%, but that's not necessarily the case. If you got pension in a few years and social security in a few years, you might be able to do four or even 5% for just a few years and, and still be okay. So th this is the kind of thing it's, it's, we'll, we'll spitball it, but it's hard to give you a definitive answer. This is, this is where some software, just financial planning software really is helpful. Or a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet. And, yeah. And a calculator. Yeah. Sure. I mean, if you have that, I mean, I think you're good too. Yep. All right. Uh, thanks for the question. Dear Joe, Alan, Andy, I look forward to your podcast each week. Uh, this is Ann from New York. All right. They've helped me so much in managing and understanding my finances. I would really enjoy a second one each week in the future. It'll be all about beer. <laughs> yeah. Start bringing in your life questions, right? Cocktail questions. Then we could have more to talk about. Yes, we can keep oh, going. Don't ask yeah. Joe anything about cocktails. He'll just tell you to drink Coors Light. Coors Light, maybe maybe a little fireball on the side sometimes. <laughs> only special occasions. <laughs> it's like one extreme or the other. <laughs> I only like Coors Light and fireball. Well, you know, you just it's a little cutter, Al. <laughs> just I, your... I get it. Uh, we are currently 64 in 58. Before taxes, we currently have annual expenses of $85,000. My husband will start collecting Social Security at 70, approximately $4,200 a month. And at that time, I'll also start collecting Social Security, uh, approximately $1,400 a month, if I don't start collecting my own on my own record at age 62. 
Number one, my reduced benefit on my own record appears to be $5,500. If I start collecting at 62, is it better for me to start collecting Social Security on my uh, own record and then switch to the spousal benefits at 66 or just wait until like 66 and collect the spousal benefits so that the spousal benefits are not reduced more? Um, you can't switch anymore, my friend Anne. So she wants to take her own and then switch to the spousal. It's deemed. So if she takes her benefit at age 62, they're going to take a look at what, what is going to be hired, the spousal benefit, as long as your husband's collecting. Right. If your husband's not collecting, then you collect on your own benefit at age 50 or 62, and then you can switch to the spousal benefit once he starts collecting, and it's going to be a reduced benefit. So you take... $1,400 a month. So that's 50% of his benefit at age 67. And you're going to take 30% of that, which is $420 uh, versus $550. So if you take your own benefit, it's going to be higher than the reduced spousal benefit. So take your own, that's fine. Or I would just wait until your full retirement or until you reach full retirement age to take the $1,400 a month. I was I was even impressed with myself that on was, that one. That was like I'm thinking, man, I would need a calculator on that. Killed You're, it. You got a calculating brain. Killed it. Uh, uh, when my husband reaches age 72, <laughs> these RMDs will be approximately $172,000 a year, and our combined Social Security will be $67,000 a year. That is $240,000 a year. How much should we keep in liquid funds in case the market tanks? Since we do not want to to sell our RMD stocks if the market is down tremendously, but rather transfer it out in kind. Okay. <clears throat> and where should we keep these liquid reserves? Should we keep five years of cash reserves in case of a longer market downturn? Thanks for your help. Okay. I don't get the question here because she already knows that she can take a. Yeah. So she doesn't need any cash. Right. If, 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 the, if the RMD is $172,000, you don't have to take that money in cash. You take the $172,000 out as shares of stock. Yeah, I you think, just put it into a brokerage account. I think a lot of people don't understand you can do that. So your RMD, it doesn't have to be a check. It doesn't have to be cash. It can actually be shares of stock. So it goes from your IRA, your 401k, into your brokerage account. The, the Where you want to have cash is how much money that you need from the overall portfolio right. to live off of. So do you need to spend the $172,000? Uh, plus your social security. So are you spending 240? Again, missing components in the questions. No, no, no. We we're currently have annual expenses of 85. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'm sorry, Ann. <laughs> you're good. So yeah, the, the fixed income, your social security is almost covering $85,000. Yeah. You don't really need much cash here. You don't. Um, you know, do you want five years of cash? Sure. But the cash is not the RMD amount. Right. What you want five or 10 years in cash is what the demand of the portfolio is, of what you're actually taking and converting to cash to spend, not the RMD, because the RMD is not going to be converted to cash as you can just take it in kind as shares and put so, it in a brokerage so account. Question for you. I know you can do that from an IRA to a brokerage account. Can you do that from a 401k? Absolutely not. Okay. That's why I, I, I stand corrected on that one. Right. So, so, that, so there, if it's from a 401k, you can either roll that to an IRA so you can do that. So that's one approach. Or another approach is if it comes out of the 401k in cash, just buy those same securities in your brokerage account. And you're kind of same, same. Yep. You can transfer shares out in kind. Like if you do a Roth conversion too, you can convert from yeah. um, IRA to Roth yep. as, yep. as yep. shares. How and when to collect Social Security is one of the biggest decisions you will make about your retirement. Our Social Security Handbook will help you as you make those decisions with valuable information about how much your payments can grow, how they're taxed, spousal and survivor benefits, and much more. Our Retirement Readiness Guide breaks down how to create retirement income, prepare for increased longevity, and control your taxes in retirement. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to get your free copies of both both the Social Security Handbook and the Retirement Readiness Guide from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And if you want to thank us, just share about the podcast and the free resources with anyone that will benefit from all the free financial information, entertainment, and beer and tax chat. Uh, Sharon from Waukesha, she, is she back? 
I think we've had multiple people from Waukesha. Now that they've heard you say it, they're coming out of the woodwork. Because I can say Waukesha, they're like, well, you can he's... say it. It's like you're the only one. Yeah. He's the... I mean, I can't say a lot of words, but I you can, can say, say Waukesha. Waukesha. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a great town name. It is. I like that. Yeah. It's a nice little, nice little town. Yeah. Uh, John Big Al, thanks so much for your show and for sharing your thoughts on my questions in the past. Yeah, I knew yeah you did now, right? Yeah, there you go. You, you've got that steel trap brain. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> Just get to my age. Steel sieve, whichever. The, steel, steel at my trap. age, things start to slip out a little bit. A little bit. Uh, your money, your wealth is my first choice in podcasts. Wow. Wow. Out of everything? Out of just, wow. All podcasts? There's like 3 million podcasts out I there. I would say That's... that I, I don't even subscribe to this podcast. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know you do. But you I, love haven't, to, to, I haven't, I haven't hear heard it voice. in five years, but I, I am a subscriber. Uh, well, yeah, because in the back of the day, we were, we we were trying had. to get subscribers. <laughs> we only had it, two. it was your mom and my mom. <laughs> So I made it three. Yes. Oh, uh, I have another question, which I don't know if I heard come up on recent shows. Okay. Uh, any idea on how to best leverage a whole life policy? I have a 90 life whole polo, um, whole life insurance policy, Northwestern Mutual. I don't need the life insurance. And now I want to be smart with leveraging the accumulated cash value. I'm single 59 and retiring next year. I want to use the cash value in this policy to support future retirement expenses. I don't have an immediate need for it. Uh, here are the details. So purchase policy back in 05 cash value, 74,000 cost basis is 65,000 monthly premium of 362,000 annual premium of $4,300. All righty. Okay. So, do I see the cash value increasing each year? Um, so I do see the cash value increasing each year. How should I look at the growth or the ROI in the cash value component to the cost of the premiums? Would it be better to just surrender the policy now and drop the cash into a brokerage account? Or I could continue to pay the premiums to grow the cash value if there was a long-term benefit. I'm sharing some details on past growth. As of June 2021, death benefits $270,000, cash value of 73. Uh, previous year, cash value increases was $7,000. Uh, okay. Yep. As of June 2020, death yep. benefit is 263, 66. So another cash increase of six grand. Um, thank you for your words in your show and continue to make me smile. All right, Sharon. Well, I guess if you take the increases minus the premium, it's it's around two or three thousand dollars. Okay, something, something like that. So we got three thousand dollars in then compared to the cash value. Is so, 70, 74,000? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So call it four percent. Yeah, four percent. So that's your rate of return. That's your ROI. Yeah, that, that's your ROI. And could could you do better than that? Well, sure. If you didn't have life, if you don't need life insurance, right? Why pay so, for it? Because here's the deal. Um, she's in a, a, a policy that's given her a good fixed rate um, that, hey, you know, it's Northwestern Mutual, which is a, a really good insurance company. They've been around, I think, right when Alan was born. What is it? What is a 90 life whole life policy? That's just the name. I think it's that's the name of the that policy. Who knows? Okay. Uh, don't work. I, th I thought it might be something that something special just, as, as a tax guy I wouldn't know. Got it. Um, maybe it's paid up in age 90. Something, who knows? Okay. Maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, all right. Here's the, here's the, here's the pros. All right. So yeah. you're getting a, a, a good rate. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so it's growing right. tax deferred. Yeah. So you can take the, let me finish my point, just, Alan. You're just so excited. Oh, I just can't wait. <laughs> Here's the pros, and then Alan can give you his pros. It's tax deferred. You have a decent rate of return. Uh, if you pull the money out correctly, the money will come out to you tax free. Um, and if you die prematurely, you have leverage in regards to a two hundred seventy thousand dollar life insurance policy that could go to your beneficiaries. Those are the pros I see. Alan, comment. Yeah, no, th that is the pros. But my my con was, if you don't need life insurance, you're paying. You're, you're paying money for, you're paying four grand for life insurance. Right. So here's the con is that if you really want the money to live off of taking cash value from a life insurance policy is somewhat unique and challenging to it because the policy needs to stay in force. Right. So if you wanted the, the cash value of $74,000 and you said, you know what, I'm going to pull, you know, $70,000 out next year. 
uh, and then you got four thousand dollars remaining in the policy. The cost of insurance is going to continue to increase because you have a two hundred seventy thousand dollar death benefit. There's a cost to that, right? Right. But right now, your premiums that you're paying plus the interest rate is covering the cost of insurance plus giving you a, a premium on those dollars, which is great. But if you start taking dollars from the cash value, right, um, you got to keep the policy in force. If the policy laps, that means either the cash value is gone and then your premium turns instead of $4,000 to $30,000, you're going to be like, I'm not going to pay this. And you're going to let it lapse. And then everything that you took out after basis is going to be taxable as ordinary income. Yeah, that's right. So have you ever, any of you ever heard this from a life insurance person is you can have, you can build up your cash value and then you can access it tax-free. And that is true as long as the policy stays in force and it's at, at a certain age, it may get to be rather expensive to keep it in force, but that's the problem. If you take too much out and there's not enough cash value to cover some of these premiums, then you've got to pay premiums from other income just to keep it in force to keep that a tax-free loan. So if, if you look at it like this too, um, so $65,000, um, first of all, 2000 so let's see, $65,000 is the, the cost basis. So that's her premiums paid in. Right. Right. So that's the present value. Yep. The future value today on that is 74000 Yep. Right. And then if I'm looking, you've ha- had this for 16 years. What is your internal rate of return? Right. Um, and then you're adding, I'm sorry, what is she adding to this? $4,000? Right is 4300 is the annual premium yeah just totally blew this thing well, would you have to <laughs> subtract the cost of insurance out to get the of course you rate of return i'm just spitballing this <laughs> <laughs> oops 45 well while you're doing that i'm just going to spitball one second um i personally would surrender the policy that's what i would do i would too um the the rate of return is okay. Internal rate of return. Um, I keep on. And, and, and part, part of the reason I say that Sharon is because you don't need the insurance. You, you, you earn $10,000 in 16 years. Right. And you're and, paying $4,000 a year. And, 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 and you got insurance all along, but you don't really need it. Right. right. So, so you paid 65 to get 74, right. Over yep. 16 years. So if you cash it out, you're going to be taxed on the growth, but you have 65 of basis that comes to you. You can throw that into a brokerage account. Right. The other 10,000 is going to be taxed. Yeah. Um, and then you get rid of the insurance. So if, you know, call it what it is and move on. Yeah. If you want to avoid the tax, you could do something really stupid and move it into an annuity. Um, <laughs> but you probably don't. Then you can annuitize it and prorate you could, the tax. You can prorate and, then, it and pay the tax slowly, but it's only 9000 of gain right now. So it's not that much. Right. So if you don't need the insurance, I would get rid of it. If you want leverage and die with the policy and give it to you know whoever, then keep the policy. Yeah, I'm, I agree. All right. Uh, thanks, Sharon from Waukesha. Edward from Illinois writes in, I drive a 2010 Honda Accord with $98,000. 98,000 miles. Lots of life left. Yeah, I would agree. Honda oh. Accords, they go forever. Yeah. Uh, I have been buying preferreds as my fixed income since uh, bonds, et cetera, pay nothing. Okay. I buy mainly big banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, City, et cetera. They seem to pay around 4%. I own some older ones approaching call date, paying close to 6%. Preferreds are about 15% of my portfolio. I'm wondering if I'm taking on too much risk. Tell me your opinion. P.S. I drink Land Shark beer mainly. That's uh, Jimmy Buffett beer. You know what? This is a new, this is it. We're changing the rules on the podcast. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we started out and with the whole car thing and the, the pets. Yeah. It's because it gets me in the zone. Right. <laughs> We like oh, to- I see where this is going. The zone is much better for Joe if it's beer. I like to understand what people are doing <laughs> yes. when they're listening. Got it. So when I'm giving them the answers to their questions, I like to <laughs> pretend that I'm either driving in their car, having right. a little conversation with them. Right. Right. Or if they're going on a walk. Right. Right. You know, and they got their dog with them. Sure. You know, we're, we're together. We're hanging out. I'm just yeah. in your, your ears right yes. now. Yes. Right. 
or, or if you're sitting there drinking. Yes. Now let's, we got to talk do about it. that. So, all right. So if you want the car's good, we like the car. Yeah. We like, you know, if you got a couple pets, throw that stuff in there, but now it's what, what's your drink of choice. Right. Okay. Land shark beer. You ever had Never it? heard of it. It's, it's Jimmy Buffett's, uh, 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 brand. So it, this is going to give, it's a light beer. This is going to give me stuff to do on the weekends. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's going to be great. Try all, try all the beer. Right. So, Ed, I'm going to be like, you know what, Ed? I had Land Shark beer, and it was phenomenal. Or I'm going to say it was awful. I'm going to give Actually, you my review of your drink of choice each week as no, you tell me. Knowing you, I, I would predict you would like Land Shark beer. All right. So, yeah, that's that. That's where we're going with this. I okay. think that's it. Yeah, it, we're, we're mean, done with the cars and the pets. No, they can still do that as part of the, you know. So, so this is more what they're going to be doing while they're listening to the podcast or listening to our answer or no just i i like to know what people are drinking what's okay. the choice of cocktail all right okay because no? we know that joe's is coors latte i am the what the count of coors light yes that, is that what Juan that's what said? he said yes all right land shark okay cool they got okay. a lot of swag so what do you what do you think about uh, preferred stocks instead I like, of fixed income i like preferred stocks okay i don't know how much edward has i don't know how old edward is um and I'm not sure in 15% of the portfolio and preferreds. I, I mean, if he said it's 70%, then I would be like, yeah, it's a little rich, but 15% of preferreds. It sounds like he's fairly sophisticated knows uh, what he's doing to preferred acts like a bond. Well, presumably um, he's got um, 85% in stocks. I'm guessing because he says he does preferreds instead of for his bonds. Correct. Um, and if, but if Edward's pulling income from the portfolio, I don't know. Yeah. Um, if he want, if he's if he's using the preferreds as income generation, like saying, "Hey, I'm getting four percent and six percent, and he's living off that versus reinvesting." Sure. Um, you know, preferreds have their place, of course, in the portfolio. Um, but I don't like to just leverage preferreds as an income generator. Uh, we remember we dealt with that before. It's like uh, preferreds and MLPs and all sorts of other type of. Um, uh, income producing or only dividend paying stocks. So they load it up on just these sectors or these right. certain categories. Um, I hate those portfolios, but if you got 10, 15% of preferreds, I think you're okay. Yeah. Well, I think the bigger question is, is a hundred percent stocks, the right allocation? allocation and Edward would need to know your age and, and whether you, what, how soon you're going to need any of this money. Uh, all right. Land chart. Okay. Yes. Folks, give me your, <laughs> no one's gonna do it because i want people to get i want to do life advice yeah and i want to know what you're drinking cocktail i guarantee you people are going to say what they like to drink all right all right uh folks thank you so much for your questions um keep them coming bring your cocktails in we're gonna have a party uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you again next week. Show's called Your Money Well. Joe's Honda Accord, Police Academy, Caddyshack, and more beer in the derails at the end of today's episode. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment video call. It doesn't matter where you are in the country, and chances are... One of the certified financial planners at Pure will be able to identify strategies that will help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. I had a Honda Court college. Did you? Yep. Yep. I had to kick out the back window. Why? Because you're you're too big. You're too tall. <laughs> you can't, yeah. I'm like, like too that. tall. You know, it's, it's like, that thing. <laughs> oh, my roommate. Um, remember, remember? Remember? Well, I, yeah, police academy. Yeah. Well, I was think, I was thinking when I was younger, it was the Volkswagen Bug Beetle, and there were basketball players that were driving the car from the back seat. I do remember that. <laughs> oh my god. That's the same. Story. I was going to say with Ed Tutal Jones yeah. in the Police Academy. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. You've never seen that movie. Yeah, yet. but like 20 years ago, Joe, so I don't remember <laughs> it, all these details that you remember. <laughs> I go on to other better things. <laughs> you stopped me. <laughs>
Go on. I can sit here and talk about Police Academy. All I day. know you can. <laughs> I can. I can. Now I've seen Caddyshack enough times. I could probably quote different things out of there. All right. Um, I'm gonna try Swing Lube. That's another um, another beer. <laughs> Swing Lube. Now, when I was in Nashville a couple weeks ago, yes, and we stayed in it's the just mar- drop in Nashville like it's yeah, going and we, out of and we stayed in the Margarita Hotel uh-huh. in Nashville. I had several land sharks. All very, right, very good. Okay, so Ed, I'm gonna try some land shark beer. Um, I'm not sure if you can get it in San Diego. You might have to go to Bevmo or something. Oh boy! All right. <laughs> 